In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Since wounds can be either psychological or spiritual, we'll break the next two harmonies into the psychological and the spiritual ways of healing. So the first thing we want to do is talk about how we heal on a psychological level. And obviously it'll have a spiritual impact, but there are certain things on a psychological level um, or just on a natural level that people can do in order to start the healing process. The healing of a wound requires the healing of the faculties involved in the wound. In other words, if we're wounded psychologically, our faculties are disordered, they're dysfunctional, there's something wrong with them. And so what we need to do is get them corrected and to be able to see. Now, the principal way that our faculties are corrected is by the truth. That is the consideration of the truth. Not just the truth of the wounds and things of that nature, but the truth of things like forgiveness and that. The other kinds of truth that will actually help us to heal. In the context of prayer, we'll talk about how that helps as well. But in this particular case, it's a matter of just considering the truth of the person's situation rather than following their emotions or things of that sort. And the truth in the intellect will help to correct the will because it's become disordered and also will help to correct the lower faculties because as we imagine the truth, then our emotions and things like that will begin to kind of fall into place. That's how we habituate our emotions is by consideration of the truth or following the truth despite how we feel. It requires a healing or a purification of the memory. This will allow the habituation of the memory regarding the, the image that we have of, um, of the injury. In other words, we have to stop thinking about the thing that's causing us to be wounded so that it, our memory won't keep recalling it. Because every time we keep thinking about it, we're actually habituating our memory to keep recalling it, which perpetuates the wound. So we actually have to kind of get it out of our imagination. Not thinking about the injury, we begin to train ourselves not to associate the injury with ourselves or with whoever, but we'll be able to begin the process of kind of clearing our, our mind. Custody of the mind, then. That's really what this is about. Now, normally, custody of the mind is in relationship to matters of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments, but it's a much broader virtue. It has to do with anything that can cause a spiritual or psychological harm. We have to keep those things out of our imagination. So stop thinking about it, really. That's the goal. Now, sometimes that's hard because it's kind of obsessive. But if people can begin chiseling away at it slowly but surely, like any other habit, it usually, it's not corrupted. It's, that is, that's the technical word they use in moral theology. It's not undone in a single act. It takes repeated work at it, getting it out of your mind and constantly. And then the lower faculties will be trained not to think about it. That's called custody of the mind. It's a virtue. In fact, the obsessiveness, obsession, is, in fact, a lack of custody of the mind. That's its principal vice. Cust la um, obsession is, unless it has a demonic cause, and sometimes even then, it's rooted in, the, in a vice, which is thinking about something that harms us. That's vicious. We have to stop thinking about it. So you have to get your mind off of it. You also have to practice custody of the senses. That is, get your... Get your senses out of, off of the things that are going to be a problem. If watching TV or looking at pornography or if dealing with certain things, you've got to get your mind off it. Even if it's just for a short period of time, that means getting your senses off of it. And this is because it ends up hurting you. This is one of the reasons I tell people, you know, quit listening to the rot about the church. We all know that, you know, the members of the church are not in good shape morally and spiritually right now. You don't need to listen to every little last detail because all it's doing is dragging you down spiritually. And this is one of the things that's important for us as traditionalists because we love the church. And every time we hear some scandal or hear some pre priest preaching heresy because we love the doctrine of the church or we hear some liturgical abuse because we love the liturgy, it hurts us. Now, we have to be willing to suffer that, but at the same time, sitting there and looking at every single thing that's going wrong, all it's doing is just hurting us. You know, it's just dragging us down. We've got to get our mind off of that kind of thing. We have to correct our judgment. 
and habits of thinking by looking at the thing that's wounded us rationally and not from the point of view of our emotions, it is how we feel. And by rationally, we mean we have to consider the various truths in this thing. Okay, so someone might have hurt us, but we have to look at it, we'll talk about this more in the context of forgiveness later. I'm going to talk about forgiveness here in a minute, but we also have to talk about it in a spiritual context, looking at it from the point of view of forgiveness, looking at it from the point of view of what's best for the people spiritually, things of that sort. If we look at it from, the, from a, a rational point of view, we'll begin to realize that, you know, you know, meditating on how bad it is and feeling bad about it is actually counterproductive. In other words, we have to start correcting our habits of thinking. The intellect is like any other faculty. It can be habituated into patterns of thinking that are unhealthy. Guess what that's called? Mental illness. So what you have to do is you have to get your mind off that thing and start looking at things from the point of view that is true and healthy. We also have to remember that you know, we have darkness of the intellect, which is the result of original sin, laboring under original sin. So how do we overcome that? Well, first of all, considering various truths, of course, but we also recognize that it's human frailty, which is the basis of forgiveness of other people. People are just weak. People are just clueless. So we just have to be willing, and we would be just as bad, if not worse. There's not a single sin that not any one of us would commit if God retracted his grace. It's that simple. So when we look at other people, we shouldn't be sitting there thinking in terms of, look what you did to me, but in terms of, I could have been just as bad, if not worse. Also, we have to recognize that faith is the first purification of the intellect. In other words, not only is our intellect darkening, and as a result it's wounded and clueless, and needs purification because we tend to think things that are wrong, but it also, faith is the first illumination on a supernatural level of the intellect so that the faith actually can help us to adjust how we understand certain things on a spiritual level to help us to begin to heal. In other words, God will forgive us if we've hurt ourselves. Meditating on God's forgiveness, the healing effect of his forgiveness is very powerful. Meditating on his forgiveness so that we should forgive other people Recognizing that, um, you know, we, that God is, should be the center of our attention, not ourselves. And this is one of the things that when people are wounded, they're thinking about themselves. And they have to realize, look, I'm just not that important. My life is just not that important. God is the thing that's important. That's what faith tells us. So it's the first purification. And in a certain sense, it's the first healing of the intellect on that level. Then there's, of course, forgiveness. Now, in the next time, I'm going to talk about forgiveness from a spiritual point of view. But right now, I just want to talk about the necessity of forgiving people, forgiving oneself, purely from a psychological point of view. When people hurt us or when we hurt ourselves, you've heard me use this analogy before, it's like them sticking a knife in us. It's a wound. And if we hold on to it, if we hold on to the debt that they owe to us. In other words, they've committed some injustice against us which they owe to us, and they still kind of owe us. So that's the thing we're holding on to, that wound. Now, as long as you're holding on to a knife, it's just gonna sit and continue cutting you. That's just all there is to it. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. And eventually, it's like any knife, eventually it's gonna cut your fingers off if you keep holding on to it. Well, eventually it's gonna cut your rationality right out of you if you don't let loose of it. So what's the moral to the story? You have to let loose of these things for your own sake. Even if it's your own, if you've done something to wound yourself, like in cases of women who've had abortions and things like that, you just have to be able to let loose of it. Yes, what you've committed is, is grave, but there's God's forgiveness. And if he can forgive you, there is, it's sinful not to forgive yourself because it's against charity. It's against God's mercy. Doesn't mean you let yourself off the hook about reparation, making reparation for your past sins. It just means that you have to let loose of the blame and just be able to get your mind off of it and forgive yourself for your own sake. And if other people have hurt you, you've got to let loose of it for your own sake. 
The commandment of Christ to forgive our neighbor is not just to fulfill charity. It's there because it will drag us down if we don't forgive ourselves, if we don't forgive other people. It'll destroy us spiritually if we're not careful. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's going to happen with the other person. People think, well, if I let loose of it, then he's getting off the hook and he owes me this. Yeah, he does. But he's not getting off the hook. No one is. It's called the final judgment. Every single one of us has to stand before every single angel, every single demon, every single person that's ever lived and account for every infraction of the law publicly before God, every single infraction. So nobody's getting off the hook. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Let him deal with it. He'll deal with it in the past. You have to let loose of it for your sake. Don't forget that there will be a final judgment, but that shouldn't be your focus like, oh good, he's really going to get it later. Because what are you doing? You're just renewing the wound. Just let loose of it. We also have to recognize that sometimes we can forgive people in our will. We can let loose of the injury. We can want to let loose of it. We can just say to ourselves, okay, I'm not going to think about it. But if we've been thinking about the wound, our lower faculties have been habituated. And that means that um, our emotional life is not going to immediately follow suit. Now sometimes it will quickly follow suit if we see some profound truth in relationship to, okay, God allowed me to suffer this because I was proud or something like that and he wanted to bring me down so that through my humility I would be more pleasing to him. Maybe. And so sometimes that itself can help the families, but a lot of times it doesn't. A lot of times the wound is something that's in us habitually, and we need to continue to think in terms of these things to look, slowly get them off the mind. And then once we think we've overcome it, sometimes we'll be around the person, and we just happen to see the person who's hurt us, and all of a sudden, whew, it flares up again. But instead of focusing on that, we have to think to ourselves, okay, I need to continue to work. I still need to heal. The other thing is... Stop sinning. Because every time you sin, you wound yourself. Not just spiritually, but psychologically. Every single time you sin, you're messing up your psychological faculties, so you just have to stop it. And that's the thing we have to remember. Seeking counsel of others, a lot of times, is quite important. If we're wounded and we just can't seem to overcome it, we need to talk to somebody who can help us work through the process of it. St. Thomas makes the observation that sometimes by taking our pain to someone else, they can help carry it. And that itself will lighten the burden of the pain. So that's one of the ways that we can actually begin to heal is by talking to someone else. Now, you have to be careful because some people go from person to person to person to person to person to tell them about all their woes in order to get the pleasure out of feeling about it. That's just an addiction to the wound, ultimately. Because the person wants to hold on to the mulling over of how painful this is and then they feel good about everybody. They've got to stop that. But it's good to have one or two people that you can really help to work this thing out with. Sometimes St. Thomas says crying. He says, every time we perform an action that's in congruity with our disposition, we get a pleasure out of it. So if something's hurt us and we cry, that crying is in congruity with what our disposition is. And so he says we get a certain pleasure out of it. And from that, it lightens the burden. Now, I'm not suggesting that men go around bawling all the time. Because if a guy's crying all the time, it's kind of a lack of masculinity. He should be able to heal and deal with these things on a, kind of, on a more rational level. But crying also at times for him is suited. It's appropriate. You know, real men don't cry. That's just hog fooey. You know, it's just garbage. There are certain things that if you don't cry, it's disordered. You know, if your wife dies and you don't cry, there's something wrong with that. You know, or if someone has done, if someone's like killed your daughter, well, you know, you should be, that, that's something to cry about. Because why? It's something that's sad, and refusal to, be, to manifest the proper effects of sadness is disordered. But on the other hand, going around bawling all the time is just an addiction to emotions, and that's contrary to masculinity too. So, but the point is, is that 
Crying sometimes can help to release it a little bit. You'll find once in a while people will be severely wounded and they refuse to cry about it, and that itself is a disorder which perpetuates the wound. So we should also develop virtue. If wounds are really disorders in our lower faculties, that is, at least initially, the wound is something that is not a disorder in the sense of that we, we've volitionally made it so. But it is something that is caused a disorder there, like in our, just the association we have of something really bad happening to us is painful, then the way we overcome it is through virtue. In other words, if these things disorder our faculties, then virtue is the thing that reorders them. The more virtuous a person is, the less they're capable of being wounded, and the more they're able to overcome any kind of wounds. This is quite important. Sometimes, excuse me, sometimes God allows a person to be wounded precisely because he wants that person to excel in virtue. This is true if we go to war and the horrificness of the war has hurt us psychologically or if it's left us with damage. He wants us to obtain patience. He wants us to obtain other things. It's true if we have um, been wounded by somebody and there's this deep interior pain from it. He wants us to grow in the virtue of forgiveness, in the virtue of charity, and things of this sort. In other words, our woundedness is an ability to grow in virtue. And so this is true, not just on the level of natural virtue. He wants us to just on a natural level get ourselves straightened out. But it's also true on a supernatural level. I used to pray. I used to ask God, you know, make my heart like unto thine. And I used to have this image where I would pray to Jesus, asking him to take my heart and put his in. And I had the image of the crown of thorns, right? that I knew that this meant that there was going to be suffering and, you know, that type of thing. And of course, that's just the life of a priest. But little did I know that what he was going to ask for me is to carry other people's woundedness. That's what hearing confessions is about. That's what doing counseling is about, is to help people to carry their woundedness. And in that, through true compassion, the priest himself begins to form that wound which Christ had in his heart from other people's sinfulness. That's, in a certain sense, what he wants for all of us. For a priest, it's more required, and there's more opportunities for it. That's what's expected of him. But if we want our heart to be like Christ, or even our ladies, who is sevenfolded, in a sevenfold manner wounded, we have to get to the point where we heal from our own wounds, heal from our own, stop sinning, and heal from those other things, and then we will make us, in a certain sense, a victim, where we begin to carry the wounds of other people, so that through that we may become perfect in virtue, in a level that we could never become otherwise if we had not been wounded. Not by our sin, but by carrying other people's wounds. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost,